If you would, go ahead and take your Bibles and turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 10. The Gospel of John, chapter 10. Uh, We took a break from going through the Gospel of John. We've been through the first nine chapters together. We took a break for Advent and the Christmas season and State of the Church. And now we're back in chapters 10 through 15, right here in the second half of the book. And this passage is obviously about Jesus being a shepherd. We talked about that with the kiddos a moment ago. This is a passage which a lot of us have heard before, but it's really rich when you stop to think about what Jesus is saying and what he means. He's talking to a crowd of people that clearly include Pharisees, the leaders, because he's going to basically talk about them. And they're clearly part of this group. And remember what Jesus has just done. Now, it's been like since November when we last covered John's gospel. So does anyone remember where we left off, what was going on at the time from chapter 9? Anyone remember? Because we took a break, but this just happened shortly after other stuff. What's that? A blind man was healed, and he was interrogated by the religious leaders who wanted to know how Jesus did this because they didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah, but they also could not deny the miracle. And so they were torn about what to do with Jesus. And it's at this point that Jesus speaks, at least at this season. It might have not been the next day or even the next week, but it was in this season that Jesus will speak these words about shepherds. Now, to give you some background, in a moment we'll look at Ezekiel 34. There's a lot of background about shepherds in the Old Testament, a lot of references to God being his people's shepherd. And it's helpful to know that in the culture in which Jesus lived, a shepherd was a metaphor for a leader. I mean, clearly there were actual shepherds of sheep, but kings were referred to as shepherds. Leaders were referred to as shepherds. And people were very familiar with that metaphor because there were shepherds everywhere. Sheep was all, were all over the place. That's what they ate. They ate sheep. They, they wore wool. So they were used to any metaphor referring to sheep. So when Jesus first starts talking, it sounds like he's talking about sheep husbandry or, 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 or sheep herdsman principles. And people are like, yeah, we know. They must be thinking, why is this rabbi telling us about sheep and shepherds? Like, we know all of this. Because the stuff he's saying in the beginning is stuff they already know, stuff that's true. And so the Jesus has to explain what he means by what he's saying. And then he unpacks it. So if you're able and willing, I'd like to invite you to stand with me in honor of God's word as we read this together. Chapter 10, verse 1. I tell you the truth. The man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of his sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. At these words, the Jews were again divided. Many of them said, he is demon-possessed. 
and raving mad. Why listen to him? But others said, these are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Let's pray. Father, help us to understand these words, to understand better who Jesus is, and to understand, importantly, Father, what you're inviting us to do in response, that we might obey you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So Jesus begins with a metaphor about shepherds and sheep. And the people are confused, and so Jesus has to unpack it. And clearly, he's referencing leaders and leadership and good leaders and bad leaders, which we find in places like Isaiah and Ezekiel in the Old Testament, a reference to shepherds who didn't take care of God's people. Why do we have leaders? Why do we follow leaders? I mean, the reality is all of us want something, and you can, you can describe it in different ways, but every one of us wants something. And we look to leaders to provide these things. Every leader, politicians, authors, artists, everyone ultimately we look to, whether we're listening to a podcast or reading a book or voting, we look to leaders to provide us a taste of what we want. And all of us, though we would word it differently, every single one of us here ultimately wants the good life. We all want the good life. We want a taste of the good life. Every single one of us wants it. We just don't all define it the same way. So if I actually said, how would you define the good life around your tables today? My guess is you wouldn't all agree on the same stuff. But you would agree on some things. You would, you would mention some things that you like, although the variety that you like is different from the variety someone else likes. We don't all have the same tastes, right? But we all love some of the same things. How do you know what people consider the good life? Here's what you do. You, you go to their social media post, and you watch the things that people post about. What do people put pictures of on Instagram and Facebook? What, what do they tweet about? What is it that people focus on? What is it? Tell me. You've seen social media. Even if you don't have an account, you've seen it. This is one of them. I'm just going to put one up here. Food. Right? This is one of the most common ones I see. Have you noticed how often people take pictures of their food? I made a vow some time ago I will not take any more pictures of my food because I'm just sick of all the food posted on social media. And if you post food, I'm not, I'm not knocking you. You know, that's what some people do. It's just not what I do. Okay? Um, it may be your thing, but I'm like, enough of the food right? Enough of the food. Like so much food. And you know, I wonder if we're saying this is such a great meal, I want to remember it, or look at what I'm having that you're not having, right? I think there's a piece of that. Do you get the impression there's that secondary a little bit? Like it's not just look at what I'm having, I want to remember it forever. It's, and you don't have this, do you? You're not here in Greece, are you? Right? So I think a lot of it's like the second, but still it's a taste of the good life and we want to capture it. Sometimes I don't capture it. You know why I don't capture what I'm doing sometimes? This is something that, that, that people over 40 can appreciate because I'm busy enjoying it, okay? So just for the younger people out there, sometimes we don't actually take pictures of what we're doing because we're having so much fun. We're absorbing it and enjoying it. We're in the moment, and we don't have to rub it in anybody's face. We're just enjoying it, right? Does anyone, can I have one amen for that? Just one amen. Thank you. Thank you. And this is an old people thing, right? I'm in the moment. I don't have to take pictures of this stuff, um, in fact, the last time I took pictures of my food, I sent it privately by text to my kids because I'm like, I don't want the world to see this, but I, I, want, them to, I want them to feel bad that they're not having this. <laughs> not everybody, just my, just my kids. No, the reality is if you look at people's social media, you can find out what they believe is a taste of the good life. And, and people love good food, right? We don't all agree on what's good food, but we all love good food. What else do we love? What do we love? Travels. People love to travel. I mean, raise your hand if you love seeing new things and having new experiences. How many of you love that? No, probably not everybody, but most of us. I mean, some of you are homebodies. You've never left Tucson. Ooh, that's weird. But, you know, I love traveling. I love seeing new things. What else? Families. People love their families. That's probably what the bulk of pictures are about. Family and friends. The people we love. The people we enjoy. The people we get to see often and the people we don't get to see that often. We love people. What else? Animals. Yeah, we love our animals. Oh my goodness, we love our animals. We're obsessed with our animals. I think we can say we're obsessed. Uh, judging from some of the people I've looked at on social media, people love their trucks. Um, sort of a weird thing. I'm not a car person. I don't really get that. But a lot of people love their trucks and automobiles and stuff like that. Whatever, you know, each teach his own. 
Some of us love to hike and we take pictures of the outdoors. You know, we love great scenery. We love to see the mountains, snow on the mountains, stuff like that. There's all kinds of stuff. And, and you know what you take pictures of. You know what you enjoy. The reality is we all want to enjoy the good life. And that's normal. That's okay. That's how we were made. In fact, if you don't want to enjoy these things, it's because you're jaded. And you're not getting enough of it. And you're like, why bother? One of the worst things we can do, I think, is just settle. Just settle. We have this itch for far more than any person or thing on this earth can satisfy, and the Bible tells us that. In fact, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 3.11, God has also set eternity in the human heart. I want you to think about that sentence for a minute. God has set eternity in every human heart. What that means is God made you for himself. And because God made you for himself, nothing less than the eternal God will ever fully satisfy you. So this itch to travel, it's never going away. Some people move and move and move because they can't find what they want. I don't care if you move to Maui, you're never going to find what you want. You might get a taste of it. Some people look for it in relationships and they they marry different people, right? They're serial monogamous people, right? They get married to one person and they're consistent with that person until they divorce them and go to someone else. But we keep looking for the right person and we never find the right person. Look, no one is Jesus. No one can fully satisfy you. No one is God in human flesh other than Jesus. So no one can fully satisfy us. But we have this eternity in our hearts. And so we are all searching for the good life. And we're all looking for it all the time in one way or another. And we don't all go to the same places. But we're all looking for the same thing. The good life. And again, I would word it maybe differently than you would. But God made us for himself. And so we have these longings, these itches, these desires. Uh, Toys won't really fulfill that. I mean, they'll scratch it, but they won't. Traveling will scratch that itch, but only scratch it for a season. Friends, food, it's really great when you do all those at the same time, right? All that will scratch what itches, but it won't fully satisfy. It's just a taste of what we were made for because we were made for eternity. The reality is we're all looking for it, and uh, it's like that old country song, looking for love in all the wrong places. We go all the wrong places, and we look to all the wrong people, including Jesus' noted leaders. So you can write this down. We set ourselves up for disappointment, every single one of us, when we follow leaders, and I'll unpack that in a moment, who promise the good life but cannot deliver it, they cannot provide it, they cannot care for us more than they care for themselves. So I don't know who you're looking at and who you go to for advice, but you go to somebody. Maybe you have just someone you follow on YouTube or TikTok. I don't know. Maybe you listen like I do to audiobooks or, or maybe podcasts or maybe you actually read your books. That's okay. Maybe, maybe you're a reader and you have some favorite authors. Uh, maybe you're into politics and you follow certain politicians. You know, I don't know who you follow, who your gurus are. I don't know who you listen to, who you look to, whose advice you seek, whose wisdom you cherish, but I can promise you they can never give you what you want. I promise you. When we look to other people to help satisfy the deepest needs in our lives, those shepherds are going to let us down. They're going to disappoint us for two reasons. One, they can't give us what we want. They're not God. Even if they say they can, they can't. They lie. And some really want to. They just can't. They can't provide it. And the reality is, no matter how hard they try, everyone cares more about themselves than others at the end of the day. And I don't mean to be jaded. Okay, I am jaded. But I don't mean to be. Okay, I've just lived a long time. I've been burned many times. And I can tell you that people are always looking out first for themselves. So if somebody has a great deal for you, it's also a great deal for them. Right? It's got to be. That's the way things work. I mean, politicians want your vote. They'll tell you what they need to tell you to get it. They want your money. They want your respect. This is what people want. This is what every author, every guru you've ever sought out really wants is something like respect or your vote or a dollar. I remember years ago, I was at a church in in Birmingham, Alabama as a college student, and an older gentleman there uh, said, hey, hey, David, I would like to take you out. Uh, I'd like to go to lunch with you which, and, and talk to you about something I think would really help you. And, and I was young and naive. And I said, oh, awesome. So I go to this restaurant, and I sit down, and he's already there with a water bottle, and I said, she would go grab something to eat? And I'm thinking, this guy's going to buy me lunch, right? He invited me out. This is the way these things work. I'm a broken co- I'm a broke college student. He's going to pay for me. And he's like, oh, I'm not eating. 
It's like 1130. It's like noon. And I'm like, you're not going to eat? I'm, I'm kind of hungry. He goes, well, feel free to get something. So I'm looking at this guy going, this is stupid. So then I get up. I go. It's Chick-fil-A. I remember that. I go, and I, and I get my food. I come and sit down, and he's just sitting there with his water bottle, and he doesn't buy anything. And I'm like, what a cheapskate. Didn't buy me lunch. Didn't buy himself lunch. So they were sitting there talking, and he says, well, I have an opportunity I want to share with you. And I'm like, an opportunity? What kind of opportunity? He goes, well, he starts sharing this opportunity with me. Do you guys see this coming? Okay. Can you guess what's going to happen? Can you guess how the story ends? I got one word for you. Amway. Okay. One word, Amway. It was Amway. And since then, I've had other people say almost the same exact thing to me. And I'm like, uh, is this Amway? And they're like, what do you know about Amway? And I'm like, is it? Just tell me. Is it Amway? I've had this opportunity offered to me before. <laughs> My parents did it for a while. I don't want to sell stuff. I don't want to get people down line. I just don't want to do it. Okay, can we just agree to just talk about something else? So this guy was interested in helping me better my life, but only as it also bettered his life, right? Deep down, everyone out there, even if they really love you and care about you, they either cannot give you what you want or they want to give themselves something even more, and it helps to know that. Jesus knew that. He knew what was in the heart of men and women. It's helpful to know this and to realize before it's too late that everyone ultimately disappoints you. Everyone. Everyone. Ezekiel 34 um, is uh, one of the passages where, where, where God, through the prophet Ezekiel, talks about this stuff. Listen to what he said. Uh, verse 1, The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. That's the leaders. Prophesy and say to them, This is what the sovereign Lord says. Woe to the shepherds of Israel who only take care of themselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? You eat curds, clothe yourselves, with the wool and slaughter the choice animals, but you do not take care of the flock. You have not strengthened the weak or healed the sick or bound up the injured. You have brought back, you have not brought back the strays or searched for the lost. You have ruled them harshly and brutally, so they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And when they were scattered, they became food for all the wild animals. My sheep wandered over all the mountains and on every high hill. They were scattered over the whole earth, and no one searched or looked for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, because my flock lacks a shepherd, and so has been plundered, and has become food for all the wild animals. And because my shepherds did not search for my flock, but cared for themselves rather than for my flock, therefore, O shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. I am against the shepherds and will hold them accountable for my flock. I will remove them from tending the flock so that the shepherds can no longer feed themselves. I will rescue my flock from their mouths and it will no longer be food for them. This is what the sovereign Lord says. I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so I will look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. I will bring them out from the nations and gather them from the countries and I will bring them into their own land. I will pasture them on the mountains of Israel, in the ravines, and in all the settlements of the land. I will tend them in a good pasture, and the mountain heights of Israel will be their grazing land. There they will lie down in good grazing land, and there they will feed in a rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will tend my sheep and have them lie down, declares the sovereign Lord. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak, but the sleek and the strong I will destroy. I will shepherd the flock with justice. Then a few verses later, in verse 23, he says, I will place over them one shepherd. So God's going to be the shepherd, but he's actually going to give them a shepherd in his stead. He says, I will place over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will tend them. He will tend them and be their shepherd. So somehow David's a metaphor for a future shepherd, a Messiah. Verse 24, I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken and then the last two verses, 30 and 31. Then they will know that I, the Lord, their God, am with them, that they, the house of Israel, are my people, declares the sovereign Lord. You are my sheep, the sheep of my pasture, my people, and I am your God, declares the sovereign Lord. So God says, I am going to be the shepherd to my people because their shepherds did not care for them or watch out for them or look over them, and I will punish them. So he's already talking about shepherds who have not been good shepherds. Now, here's some people that uh, are the most, world's most admired people. This is as, as recently as, I think, last year. Now, this is the whole world. So there's some weird people on this list, like the premier of China, 
Like, I don't, I don't know that I would ever say I put him in my top 50. But he's up there uh, because there are a lot of people who live in China, right? And, uh, I mean, the leader of North Korea, I think, is up here. The leader of uh, Vladimir Putin is number nine, right? I wouldn't say that Putin is someone I put on my top 10 list, but he's here, right? So there's a lot of people. This is the world's most admired. Some of these names you may not even know because only people in other parts of the world even would know who they are. But there are some people on this list that you probably do know, and you can understand why people would rate them highly. Now, the people on this list are at worst, at best, at best, well-meaning people, some of them, well-meaning people who really want to make life better. They just can't. They are limited. I mean, even if someone's like the president of the United States, what can they do? Well, there's a, there's a Congress in their courts, and so they can't just do whatever they want, right? Even if you're a governor of a state, you can't do whatever you want. Your power is limited. And even if you really always wanted good things, you don't live forever. So all of the people on this list are limited. Their power is limited. At the best, they're impotent. At best, they're well-meaning but they simply cannot provide what they wish they could provide. At worst, the people on this list are abusive, and they take advantage of those who follow them. They abuse their power, and they misuse their power for their own selfish ends. At worst, some of the people on this list are actually have no concern for those they lead, for the sheep. They only care about themselves. Now, that's the reality Jesus wants you to know, and I hate to be the one to tell you, but the reality is human beings are at best too limited to give you what you need or they don't really want to give you what you really need because they're looking out for themselves. So then Jesus comes along and he says, you need a different kind of leader. And guess who that leader is? So we're going to talk about that after our intermission. So feel free to get up and stretch. There are drinks back here, bathrooms right through these doors. We'll be back in three minutes. Finish up. So all of us deep down want the good life, whatever that looks like for you. But we only set ourselves up for deep disappointment when we look to imperfect human leaders to provide what they cannot or won't. Because they care more about taking care of themselves than they do others. So Jesus is different. And that's why he calls himself the good shepherd in this passage. Jesus is different because he protects and he provides in a way, no other shepherd can, but also because he cares more about us than he does about himself. And you won't find anyone else who cares more about himself than you. And if anyone says they do, don't believe them. You know they're lying if they say that. You know, I think the best leaders could say this. I have tied my idea of happiness to the well-being of those around me. And I believe that my happiness is dependent on the happiness of those around me. Those are the most honest leaders you'll ever meet. They think that when you do better, they do better. When you improve, their life gets better. They've tied their best interest to your best interest. Those are the best, most honest, vulnerable leaders. Fake leaders, frauds, hypocrites, they will tell you they care more about you than they care about themselves. Don't believe it. They can't. It's not possible. That's why Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. Because you already love yourself. Even the person who takes their own life has a misunderstanding of shame and of whether or not dying is better, they'll be better off dead or alive. There's a misunderstanding of their value and shame. There's some messed up thinking there. But even the person who commits suicide is looking out only for themselves. They're certainly not looking out for the people who's going to have to clean up this mess and, and grieve and mourn and live without them. We naturally look after ourselves. So when the Bible says, love your neighbors yourself, Jesus assumes you love you. You may not love yourself well. You may not love yourself in a wise way, but you are looking out for your best interest. Jesus is also looking out for your best interest, and because he is perfect, and because his wisdom is flawless, he actually knows what's in your best interest. You only think you know what you want. Jesus actually knows what's best for you. Jesus is the one who can provide and protect like no one else. And that's why he uses these two metaphors. And let me explain these two metaphors, the gate and the shepherd. So the first one's the gate. So this is what um, a sheepfold or sheep pen would have looked like about that, that era. 
Now, it would have been, the ones he was talking about would have been bigger than this one, but this is a small one. You can see the idea that it's got high walls and one entrance slash exit. And do you know why the walls are so high? To keep things out, right? To keep things out. Probably to keep things in, too, <laughs> because sheep wander. They're not bright. But, so to keep the sheep in, but also to keep wild animals out, because a lot of uh, animals, like wolves, they love the taste of sheep, and sheep are defenseless, and so they love sheep. But you, you build the, the pen high enough that the, the wild animals can't jump over it. And so you put the sheep in the sheep pen for what? When do you put them in there, do you know? At night. Today you would use a barn. But in those days, you would actually use a sheep pen. So you, you bring them in at night, and that way they're safe, and they can't uh, wander off, and nothing can wander in, and they're, they're totally safe in here. But what's not in here? Well, the shepherd's usually not in there, but what else is not in there? What if you stay there for a while? Let's say you stayed in there for a few days. <laughs> Food and water's not in there. So the gate has two purposes. One, to keep the sheep in and the wild animals out. The second purpose is it opens in the morning so that the sheep can come out and eat grass and drink water and be provided for. So the gate is both protection and provision because it opens for the sheep to come in and it opens for the sheep to go out. And going out is just as important as going in because if you stay in, you die. If you stay out, you die. Do you understand? If you stay out, you die. If you stay in, you die. The reason there's a gate is to let you in and to let you out at the proper times. Jesus says, I am the gate. I protect and I provide. Now, it's an interesting metaphor Jesus uses. He talks about the sheep, the shepherd coming, and the shepherd knows his sheep by name, and he calls his sheep out. So the picture is a much bigger sheepfold with two or three shepherds worth of sheep in there, and that still happens today in the Middle East. So a lot of times shepherds will go along and they'll end up in a cave overnight, and they'll come out of the cave, and what happened during the night? Well, the sheep all intermingled. You can't keep your sheep from their sheep, and sheep like each other. They don't know who belongs to them, and they just hang out with all the other sheep. And then in the morning, they're all mixed up. So what do you do? Well, the shepherd comes out of the, the, the barn or the cave or the pen, and he basically has a unique call. And it's interesting, in, in some other languages, it's more like a song or a chant. And they say something that's basically like, here, sheep, sheep, you know, but it's kind of, you know, sing-songy. And the, the, the sheep that belong to that shepherd, that that shepherd is hand-raised, they recognize his voice and they come out. And then he waits until they all come out and he counts them up and he realizes these are his sheep and he goes on and the next one comes up. And it doesn't matter how many shepherds worth of sheep are, are mixed in, they all know their shepherd. They recognize the voice. In Jesus' case, he actually says that he knows his sheep and calls them by name. That's not usually what shepherds do. They just usually call their sheep with their call. But Jesus actually knows us individually by name. He says, I'm not just the gate, I'm also the shepherd. Now, the shepherd does the same thing the gate does. He provides and protects. He protects because he usually has two things with him, or it can be one thing that's got two different ends on it. But one is a staff, and one is, uh, one is a rod. You, you've probably heard this, like in the 23rd Psalm, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Well, those are two different things, usually. Uh, the staff it helps rescue sheep that wander on an edge, a ledge somewhere, and pulls them back because they can't turn around. You can't go backwards. The rod is a club. It's just a bat. It's something you use to beat off the bad guys, right? So when the wolves come, you need a rod to thump them in the head. That's how you tell uh, the predators, go away. So basically, the shepherd is in charge of protecting the sheep if they go astray, if they get lost, if they fall down, if there's uh, something bad out there trying to hurt them. The shepherd protects, but he also provides. He knows where the grass is. He knows where the green grass is. He knows where the tall green grass that hasn't been eaten yet is. And he knows where the streams are and where the pools of water are. Most sheep will not drink from running water. They're really super stupid. They will die of thirst in front of a stream because it's too scary. So you have to go and find a little pool somewhere where the water's not really flowing. It's fresh, but it's not really flowing. They'll drink from that. They'll drink from still waters because they're sheep. So shepherds know what sheep need better than sheep do, and they provide it. And so after a while, the, sh the sheep come to trust their shepherd. 
I saw some videos this week of people uh, trying to imitate the shepherd and call the sheep. And uh, they used the same call as the, as the shepherd. Like, you know, they watched him call the sheep. And so then they called the sheep. And the reality is they try to Im- mimic it and imitate the sheep, the shepherd's sheep call. But all the sheep do is they just kind of look up. Like, who are you? And what are you doing? I don't know you. And, and it just, you know, it's, it's, they don't run away like Jesus would say they would do. But, but in these videos, they just kind of stare at the imposters. And it's sort of funny because the sheep won't come to their non-owners, even if they try to mimic the owner. They will only follow after their shepherd. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And then he says something really unique. He says, I lay down my life for the sheep. Now, when he said that, he was breaking from all of his metaphors heretofore. Because shepherds will make sacrifices for the sheep, especially if it's their sheep, right? A hired hand, You know, that's why you have a gatekeeper. Gatekeeper's a hired hand. He works for, in this case, maybe two or three shepherds. He's just in charge of the gate, and he lets, you know, he watches over the gate while the shepherd go and sleep somewhere and hang out and by a campfire, whatever they do. A paid worker could be someone who watches the sheep while the shepherd's, you know, off on vacation. Maybe he's taking his vacation, and the sheep still have to eat. So a hired worker is not going to make the same sacrifices, right, because they're not his sheep. A wolf comes, and they're like, I'm out of here. The real shepherd who actually owns and cares about the sheep, and this is his livelihood, he, his, his livelihood depends on the sheep, he's going to fight off the predators to a reasonable degree. But, I mean, he's not going to die for them. I mean, if, they're like, if there's like 10 wolves in a pack and they're coming after him, he's like, you know, take the sheep, you know, I'm done. I mean, shepherds aren't, aren't dumb. They care more than the, the minimum wage dude. But they don't actually lay down their life for the sheep. So when Jesus says, the good shepherd, I'm the good shepherd, I lay down my life for the sheep, he was breaking with metaphor because shepherds don't lay down their lives for sheep. That would be dumb. But that's what Jesus does. Jesus says, I am actually gonna protect the flock to the point of my own death. I will actually give my life because I care more about their interest than I do my own. Who cares more about the interest of sheep than himself? No one. Jesus is the only one who cares that much. So what's the invitation here? What's the invitation for us sheep? Well, if Jesus is the good shepherd who loves us more than he loves himself, he's our leader. The only real leader who can protect and provide. The only one who can and will do for us what no one else can or will do for us. But he asks, because he's a shepherd, that we trust him. That we trust him enough to listen to what he says and do what he tells us. Sheep don't often want to go from point A to point B because they're busy eating. They're distracted. Um, The water in front of them is scary, you know. They don't want to do something, and so shepherds have to coach them. They have to talk to them. I I looked at a whole bunch of videos this week, so I'm going to show you clips from two. These are, are two female shepherds, uh, who are calling their sheep in. Once, both of them are calling at the end of the day into the barn. And it's interesting to watch this because one calls them girls, one calls them sheep. I don't think there's like any rule for how you call sheep. But they, they call the sheep, and I just want you to watch this and watch how they do it and how the sheep respond, and then we'll talk about it. Come on, sheep! sheep come on come on sheep come on sheep come on come on come on sheep good girls come on
Now, not all shepherds do what you see there. In parts of the world today, they use um, dogs and other animals to actually get behind a sheep and force them to go forward. But these two female shepherds, what they do is the way Jesus was talking, the way they, that it's been done in the Middle East for centuries, and that is leading the sheep. So shepherds actually get out in front of the sheep and walk and call them, and they follow. And this is the metaphor Jesus is using. Jesus doesn't push us from behind with a whip or a dog or with sharp bites and barks. Jesus actually leads us, like in this case. But you notice the sheep are easily, you know, distracted or discouraged. And so, in both cases, you know, the shepherds have to call them, and in one case, you know, they don't want to cross this scary water. They don't want to get their feet wet. And yet, they need to go into the barn, because if they stay out there, they will, eventually, some of them will die. Some of them will die. So, the shepherd loves the sheep enough to say, no, come on, you can do it, you can do it. And then eventually they get into the barn and they're safe. Why do the sheep listen to the voice of the shepherd? They trust him. Here's the question. Do you really trust Jesus? Do you trust him? Because at times he's telling you, come on. And you're like, that looks really wet. And Jesus like, come on. Here's what I'm going to ask you. What are you doing in your life to really listen to Jesus? What habits have you developed in your life to make sure that you are listening to Jesus and hearing him regularly? Some people expect on Sunday morning to come and hear something novel when I preach, something new, you know, they never heard before. And that's nice if you do, but you don't have to. I mean, the reality is, I've, there's nothing new under the sun. I'm just preaching what's already in here. And if you read this, I'm not going to share new stuff. If I share new stuff, it's probably heresy. The whole point of Scripture is to listen to the shepherd because the shepherd is constantly calling you out to eat, in to safety. There are real wolves, spiritual wolves in this world who want to destroy you. And you are a sitting duck, literally a stupid lamb, defenseless if you don't follow the master's voice. What are you doing every day to make sure you hear the voice of Jesus? What are you doing every day? Are you meditating on scripture? Not just reading it, are you reflecting on it? Are you meditating on it? Are you doing that daily? Are you talking to Jesus throughout the day? Do you have an ongoing conversation with the good shepherd? My guess is Jesus has a lot of instructions for you, and he is calling you just like these shepherds call their sheep. He is calling you, and some of us hear him, and some of us don't. And some of us hear him and ignore him, and some of us hear him and respond in obedience. If you really love the shepherd and really trust him and really believe that he is taking care of you and he alone is taking care of you, then you will be listening daily for his voice so that you can recognize it and do exactly what he says. And if you don't recognize his voice, that means you're not spending enough time with him. The longer sheep are with the shepherd, the more they recognize the voice. The last shepherd said um, about the sheep, the, the, the babies are still learning. So the bigger sheep responded first, and then the babies came along. The babies haven't got used to, oh, when, when she says that, it's, it's time to go in. We're going into the barn. They haven't figured it out yet because they're just now learning the shepherd's voice if you're a new believer, you're just now learning the shepherd's voice, but what are you doing to learn his voice? Because as you, as you follow Jesus, his voice should become familiar. And you should recognize when he's speaking to you. What habits have you and I built into our lives to make sure that we recognize and understand the voice of the shepherd? Because he really does love us more than he loves himself. And he alone can provide and protect 
Whatever else in this world that you think holds out hope for you, I've got news for you. You're in for disappointment. Jesus alone is the shepherd that we desperately need. Are we listening? Are we listening? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you sent Jesus to be David, to be the Messiah, to be the shepherd that we need, that all these other shepherds fail, and some do so miserably. But Father, you truly love us. And you have not left us without a shepherd because we're your sheep. And you love us and you want to take care of us for all eternity. Father, we pray that you use the courage to listen, to pay attention to your voice, and to respond quickly and obediently when we hear it. Father, teach us to have soft hearts that trust our shepherd because you really do care more about us than you care about yourself. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.